see here. That's cool. is language and social ontology, and in order to talk about that, I really would have to talk about what is language and what is social ontology, and then in order to talk about that, I have to talk about, well, how does language arise out of non-linguistic uh, phenomena, and how does social ontology arise out of uh, pre-social forms of human reality. And I think I will talk about some of those things, but our target is to get to uh, the relationship between language and society. Now, situating that problem in a larger a social, in, in a larger philosophical enterprise, we can say that in my lifetime, uh, the nature of philosophy has changed. Uh, and in particular, uh, at least from my own uh, personal development, there's a single overriding <coughs> question in contemporary philosophy. And that question is, how do we accommodate a certain conception that we have ourselves with what we know about how the world is anyway. We know that the world is composed entirely of phys entities we find it convenient to call physical particles. They're not strictly speaking particles, more like points of mass energy, but in any case, uh, we know that the fundamental reality is such things as electrons, protons, and neutrons, and subatomic particles such as quarks and muons. But that conception of reality is a conception of mindless, meaningless physical particles. And yet we have a conception of ourselves as conscious, rational, free will having, uh, social, aesthetic, political, <coughs> moral beings. And the question is, how do we accommodate those two conceptions? And the problem isn't simply one of accommodation. It isn't that we need to show how the reality of physical particles is consistent with human reality. But we have to show how the human reality is a natural development out of the more fundamental reality of the physical particles. We have to show how you get from electrons to elections and from protons to presidents. And we know that that has to be how it works because we know that if you don't have enough electrons, you can't have an election. It's like a picnic without ants. If nobody brings the electrons, no election. And so on with all the other things that we value so much. Now, this means that philosophy will have many of the same questions that it had before about the nature of language, the nature of reality, but they will be seen in a different light. Uh, we will no longer be able to think in terms of a dualistic ontology. It is one of the great dishonest cheats of Western philosophy that much of it existed on the postulation of two different metaphysical realms, Geist und Fleisch, spirit and body. You all know the, uh, the various terminologies uh, for this. Uh, and we're, we need to overcome that. We need to recognize that we live in one world. As my colleague Donald Davidson used to say, we live in one world at most. Uh, and in that world, we've got to accommodate for everything. Morality has to be part of the same reality as the reality of physical particles. Well, you might say, why not just get busy and do it? Just solve the problems. <laughs> and part of the answer is we can't make the electronics work. But anyhow, <laughs> we are confronted, we have inherited terrible traditions, and we have to overcome these traditions. And I want to mention two of them that are obstacles to the project that I'm about to undertake. One tradition is God, the soul, and immortality. We think whatever else there is in the world is God, the soul, and immortality. And I'll explain to you why they have to go uh, uh, together. No point in postulating God if he didn't give you a soul. 
No point in having a soul if it doesn't last immortally. Unfortunately, I have to tell you, that's all false, okay? I won't demonstrate its falsity. That's another lecture. All right, but on the other side, there's an equally terrible burden, an equally idiotic tradition that is called science. And the idea is that science is somehow or other the name of a set of truths, the name of a proposition. And science is by its very nature materialist and reductionist. Now this is twin conception. On the one hand, God, the soul, and immortality. And on the other hand, materialism and reductionism are both false. We have to recognize that science does not name a set of propositions, but a set of methods. There's no body of knowledge that constitutes science. What we think of today as science will, for the most part, be overthrown. I told you, the world consists of mindless, meaningless physical particles. I wish that were true. The latest word from Berkeley is that the comfortable world that we grew up on, of molecules and, and atoms and subatomic particles, that's 4% of the world. 4% of the world is like that. What's the other 96? Well, the other 96 is dark energy and dark matter. And what's dark about them? What's dark is we don't know anything. That darkness is epistemic. We're totally ignorant of 96% of ultimate reality. Okay, too bad. That's why I'm paying the damn physicist on the hill to figure out. You guys figure that out. I'll do the philosophy. Okay, so now we're going to do the philosophy. But remember, we have to overcome both traditions both the tradition of God, the soul, and immortality, and the tradition of materialism and reductionism. Now, the account that I'm going to give you is a naturalistic account in a perfectly ordinary uh, sense. But when most philosophers say they're going to naturalize the mind or naturalize intentionality, they mean they're going to deny its existence. That's because they're still in their grip of the tradition that says science is materialistic, science is reductionist. Thanks a lot. I knew these guys would get it solved. That's wonderful. Okay, this is the um, greatest thing that happened in the Czech Republic since Mocha. Let's have a good beer. <laughs> well, okay, since a uh, good beer. Uh, anyway, no, I want light. What happened to the light? Maybe they couldn't. All right, well, you can't have everything. <laughs> well, you've heard of soy, yeah, well, at least we got some. All right, how about that? Maybe we got Lumia as well. All right. So now we're going to start by giving an account of uh, uh, reality where we're going to show how money and property and government and income tax and universities and cocktail parties and summer vacations, all those things we care about so much, how they are part of the world of uh, physical particles. Now, there are a couple of steps I have to do rather rapidly, simply because we don't have enough time uh, to cover everything. But we'll assume that we have a, uh, a world composed entirely of physical particles with big chunks of dark energy and dark uh, matter. Um, <clears throat> and we'll assume that uh, some of those composed of large carbon-based molecules have evolved. Uh, they have evolved over long periods of time into us. Now one of the scandalous things about modern popular culture is the extent to which we pretend to know things that we don't know. You will constantly read in the newspapers how much we know. I'm struck by how little we know. We don't even know the origin of life on this planet. That's a scandal that we do not know that, but we don't know when and how life began. And the point, what annoys me is we never tell our students how much we don't know. We're so busy telling them how much we do know. But let's, we do know that life did begin. Here we are. Okay. Now, so human beings are the products of a long period of biological evolution, and it produced us. What did it produce when it produced us? Well, it produced beings that have consciousness and intentionality. With consciousness and intentionality come rationality, because built into the structure of intentionality are certain constraints. There are constraints on what constitutes a rational way of coordinating beliefs and perceptions, for example. 
All right, so our question is, how do we get language and society?